All right, so here we are, and we're going to talk about evolution. And uh, evolution is a term that brings up, uh, conjures up a lot of controversy, depending on which country you're from, or your background, or your religious beliefs, or popular media, or anything like that. Um, with any kind of controversial topic or anything that raises questions or people like to debate about, it's always good to know as much as possible about both sides of the argument. But in this case, we're talking about from a scientific uh, perspective. And anyways, we'll get into some further discussions a little bit later. But here's some images here that should conjure up uh, various things. If you can, can you figure out who this dude is right over here? Okay, what this is clearly a monkey. These are supposed to be some unicellular organisms cartoonized. All right, so uh, continuing on, so take a look at this image right here. That looks absolutely crazy, right? It's a bug, but it looks like a leaf. Any kid looking at that would be like, that bug is really smart, it figured, figured out how to look like a leaf, and you can probably come up with reasons why it would want to look like a leaf. So how did that come about? Did it design it itself? What is it like, you know what? All my friends are getting eaten, so I'm gonna pull one of these leaves on top of me. Was it like that? Or is it built into the DNA? If it's built into the DNA to look like that, how did that happen? Um, lots of questions come up, so think about that. Explain how this form of uh, praying mantis is more adapted to survive in its environment. By the end of this and our discussions and the questions that you have, you should be able to come up with a ex an explanation for how a physical trait like this could have come about uh, through the process of natural selection, okay, evolution by natural selection. So here is the definition, the definition, the definition of evolution, the process of cumulative change in the heritable characteristics of a population. This is very important here. Um, Try to break it down. Cumulative change means changes that are um, building up over time. Okay, That doesn't mean like me getting more muscles as I get older from working out and stuff like that. We're talking about generations and generations. Could be hundreds of thousands or millions of years of human or any kind of organism, their evolution, how they're changing. The kids look slightly different from the previous generation of kids. And after 100 generations of kids, we see a lot of things changing. Heritable is underlined right there. Heritable means we're talking about changes that are inherited. It means it's in the genetic coded in the genetic information. So somewhere tracked in the DNA. Okay, we'll talk about that again soon. Um, a few things need to be true in order for evolution to actually happen. We're going to uh, list these things. The first thing is that populations tend to overproduce. What does that mean? That means we, there tend to be more offspring than what the environment can actually support. And uh, even though rabbits seem like they can multiply out of control in our last unit, we started talking about populations, eventually you reach a point where uh, the environment can't support this large number of rabbits. You end up with a shortage of food or um, not enough places to live and things like that. Um, the consequence of overproduction is that there becomes a struggle to survive. You can't just keep on making more and more rabbits because eventually you start running out of food. Um, we see this happening with human populations as well and if, with other organisms as well too. So the key idea struggle for survival and overproduction of offspring leads to that okay there's a big bad wolf that's that's a clever wolf look at that look at that little uh, costume that's going on right there so sad another important thing is that members of a species show variation when you go and you look at a bunch of giraffes you may be thinking to yourself man all those giraffes look the same but the giraffes may be looking at us thinking man all those humans look exactly the same. But we know in our human species that everybody is different, except for identical twins. Everybody's slightly different. Some of us are taller. Some of us are faster at running. Some of us have stronger immune systems, right? Uh, so an important key point here is that members of a species show variation. So even all those giraffes that look the same to you, there's some variation going on there. Some will grow to be taller. This is coded in their DNA. Some will be faster. Some will be more likely to catch certain diseases and some will be able to fight off the, the really tough diseases. So there's a lot of variation. And if you happen to be a really tall giraffe, you just might be a little bit luckier when it comes to uh, being able to access food. 
You have a question? Okay, just leave it right here. I'm recording a thingy. All right. Number of species, so variation, and that's true for humans as well too. Variation comes around, uh, comes about because of sexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction. We're learning about this. This is not for you guys. It's just identical. Uh, thank you. Anyways, sexual reproduction uh, allows for variation to happen because you're mixing up, uh, you're creating new genetic combinations from... Do you, have we covered this yet? Well, okay, let's we'll throw it in there. Sexual reproduction, when you have the homologous chromosomes pairing up and crossing over and independent assortment, you're mixing up the chromosomes and producing a huge variety of different sperm cells and egg cells. So when they combine together, you create a combination that's never been made before. So uh, variation is possible because of sexual reproduction. Meiosis is what allows us to make these gamete cells. Random fertilization, 500 million sperm racing to get one egg cell. Uh, that's pretty random. Ooh, ooh, oh, oh, okay, there we go. Natural selection is the process. This is a really interesting, really clever concept here. Charles Darwin is the one who kind of came up with this. So uh, you have to be careful how you define these things when you're asked to explain them. There's very specific language you need to use. So natural selection leads to the increased reproduction of individuals with favorable heritable variations. That's a mouthful, but think about that. The, if there's some kind of trait that you have that makes you more likely to survive, then that could probably make you live a little bit longer. If you live a little bit longer, you're probably more likely to mate and have kids. And if that trait that made you survive a little bit longer is something that is encoded in your DNA, like your skin color or fur color or immune system, um, you might just pass on that trait to your kids. So your kids would have the same uh, fur color or immune system or something else that helped you to survive longer, they're going to get it as well. And if, that, if they get it, then they might live a little, little bit longer and they might pass that trait on to their kids as well. So this process is called natural selection where particular traits that you have may help you to survive longer so you get selected for. In other words, maybe it's not so much you being selected for, but it's your genes that are being selected for. So if I have a really strong immune system and a particular scary disease comes and wipes out 70% of the Tokyo population, but I survive because my immune system is strong and those that died, those that, that withered away, their immune systems were too weak. And maybe a lot of them didn't have kids, didn't have the chance to have kids, and so their genes have kind of been eliminated. But mine have survived because I'm still alive. And then I go in and I, I don't know, have a marriage and after crisis marriage and I have kids. Now I pass on my strong genes to my kids. So maybe when they grow up, you know, next generation, next generation. So that's what natural selection is kind of about. Better adapted individuals tend to survive and reproduce more than the less well adapted individuals. Key thing is that these traits, they have to be heritable, encoded for in the DNA. Polar bear, is that a polar bear? It looks rather skinny, but anyways, let's pretend like that's a polar bear. Polar bear has white fur, well adapted to areas where it's white all around. Put a polar bear in the middle of the jungle and they're gonna have a really tough time uh, finding things to eat because people are gonna, the prey are gonna be spying them from a, from a long distance away, okay? Is there anything that eats polar bears? Well, if there's some tigers or lions, they're going to spot some polar bears and be able to find them pretty easily as well, too. So that, in that case, it's not really good. So don't make fun of things that seem like they don't fit, because depending on the environment, uh, they could totally fit and totally beat you to death. All right, species evolved by natural sex. That's just a summary, so just take a look at this. Some cool things. Uh, the evolution of the whale. We'll watch some videos in class about this. But whales live in the water, right? But we call them mammals. You all learned that. Um, why is that? What? That's it's, it's so strange. They should be like fish, right? So why do we call them mammals? And we basically think, well, there's enough evidence now that shows that if you take a look at these pictures right here, we think that the common 
the modern Shamu. Do you guys know Shamu? Maybe that's from a long time ago. Killer whale. It looks like this. Look at the bones inside. Look at this. What is this? It looks like little feet bones, but I don't see little feet down here. Something's going on. So there's evidence to suggest, why would you have little feet bones that are hidden inside your body? It's not like you're a transformer and you can make your feet like come out of your butt. How cool would that be? But they can't do that. So why have those bones? It must be some kind of clue into their evolutionary past. And so there's actually enough fossil evidence that's accumulated for us to really think that uh, these whales actually evolved like millions and millions of years ago. They actually evolved from a creature that had four legs that ran around on land. That explains why these whales have to come up for air. Uh, they can't pull oxygen out of the water directly. They have to come up for air. It also explains the way they swim like a fish. If I'm looking top view down at a fish like swimming this way, so I'm looking from above, the fish's body like swims like this, right? That's not how a whale moves though. A whale moves like, if it's moving this way, a whale's spine moves up and down like this while it's swimming. Kind of like what a cheetah's spine looks like. A cheetah's spine or uh, a wolf, right? Their spine. A dog. When a dog runs, its spine goes well, well, and that's how whales uh, and dolphins swim. Fish do this thing, like that. Okay, so there's some other evidence, um, but DNA evidence, which we're going to come to in a second, gets pretty strong as well too. So, what other evidence is there for evolution? And there's lots of cool things. So I'm going to run through this pretty quickly. Make sure to post a question if you have one. Evidence of changes can be seen in fossils, at least the ones that have been preserved. Sometimes conditions haven't been right to allow fossils to actually get preserved because it has to kind of get frozen in time. Uh, but the ones that we find, we can try to put them in order and see what's going on. This is really cool. Uh, so DNA, DNA evidence. People, Charles Darwin made these predictions before we knew about mitosis and meiosis and DNA sequences, amino acids, hemoglobin, and all this stuff that we can we can sequence all of our DNA. Um, this stuff is pretty legitimate, and it's backed up a whole bunch of the, the ideas and the theories and the predictions, and so it's just kind of made the theory of evolution even stronger. So, I mean, if you take a look at this, so all of these animals have a hemoglobin gene that codes for hemoglobin, right? You know what hemoglobin is. In the gorillas, gorillas have hemoglobin. Rhesus monkeys do, mice, chickens, chickens, frog, and there's some scary looking thing called a lamprey. Um, if you look at these things, you would say, I am pretty, you know, me and a gorilla, we're pretty similar and stuff like that. Me and a mouse, you know, we're both mammals, but maybe me and a chicken, a chicken can try to fly, I try to fly and I die. Me and a frog were really, really different. But if you actually compare the amino acid sequence differences in the human hemoglobin protein, check this out. It seems to match up with these predictions pretty, pretty well. Mr. Lee and a gorilla, if we put our hemoglobin protein sequence like next to each other, out of the, I think it's like 400, 400 or so uh, amino acids, a gorilla and I, all our amino acids are the same except for one. We have one difference. Uh, rhesus monkeys and humans eight differences mice so you can see that there's a strong correlation between the natural animals that we think we're more we're closer to like other apes and primates and then me and a frog it's still a little further away um, but you know if you asked any kid to say are you more similar to a mouse or a frog they probably say mouse and guess what the amino acid and dna sequences uh, would match up with their predictions. Incredible stuff. Okay, I think let's stop right there. I think that's a, a good length, so make sure to continue on to part two. All right, see you later.